is. Lisa and I are so very grateful just to be a part of this family. Every day we talk about, in some form or another, <coughs> to some degree or another, whether it's over coffee or, or at, a, at a, an event, we talk about just how blessed we are to have this four Paint Church of God family. Are you glad to be a part of this? Yeah. I want you to go with me this morning to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. And I'm going to read three verses of scripture in Romans chapter 5. And just hold your hand there and hold it open for just a moment. I want to talk this morning, I want to minister, I want to, if the Lord can use me, I've asked him to use me for his glory. I've asked him for an, an anointing. <clears throat> the anointing is without repentance. The anointing is, is there. The, I ask him for an unction. I ask him for to be efficient and to be effective. I want to talk about hope. I specifically want to talk about hope. Because it seems as though everywhere I look, there's hopelessness. We have seen through the years an epidemic of suicide. In Fort Payne, Cal County, in the tri-state area, it is much higher than it has been in even recent years. In other words, there's a spike in the city of Fort Payne, we've seen a spike of not only the young, but of different age groups. When I think of someone taking their own life, I think about how hopeless they must have felt. How hopeless. And it, it tears my heart. It, it burdens me, and I have wept over when folks, when young men and young women, when moms and dads and grandparents and soldiers and police officers and first responders and pastors, when people from every walk of life are seemingly reach a point that they have no hope, then I want us to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to us today about hope. I don't think we have to spend a lot of time defining hope. You know, faith comes by hearing here by the word faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope is when you can see something in your spirit but not in your with your eyes. Hope is when you know somebody in in somebody in Las Vegas playing a slot machine has got hope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they hope that it's rigged. Statistically, they're not going to win. But they got hope. <laughs> one more pull. One more hit. One more game. One. If someone can have hope in Vegas, surely they can have hope in Jesus. Yes, amen. 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 I'm just here to tell you that my God is not a slot machine. He, is a, he has a proven track record. And you and I can have hope in Jesus today. Romans chapter 5, verse 3, not only that, but we also glory, or in some versions, translations, it uses the word rejoice, that we also glory or rejoice in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character produces what? Hope. Well, now we know where hope comes from. Hope does not come from a bottle. Hope does not come from the medicine cabinet. It doesn't come from a smoke. It doesn't come from a relationship. Right. Verse 5, now hope does not disappoint this real hope. It does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who 
YouTube has given to us. So the question is, how can we have hope when everything looks hopeless? Well, first of all, I want to say that when everything looks hopeless, we need to change our lens. Yes. See? Some of us need to put on the right glasses when we can't see hope. Because hope is there. Some people become intoxicated with the world and the things of the world to the point that they cannot see. I don't understand. I don't know what it is to be intoxicated, but you know, maybe you can become so high or so intoxicated or so influenced by a drug that you cannot see correctly. And when you are drunk on the things of the world and your life has become contaminated with sin and Satan has produced those cataracts, if you would, in your spiritual eyes and you no longer can see hope, I am ministering and preaching to you today. The Holy Spirit wants to remove the cataracts from your eyes. He wants you to know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. Amen. And for some reason, we forget that. For some reason, we neglect that. And sometimes people just rebel against it. They don't want anything to do with Jesus. Amen. When we have hopeless challenges and suffering and situations, we need to do a few things. Number one, I want to tell you, we need to rely on God's presence. Rejoicing in suffering does not mean that we celebrate when bad news comes. Do not misunderstand this. Don't misunderstand James when he, when he tells us to rejoice in trials. It doesn't mean that we celebrate them. It means that, it means that we understand the truth about them. And we're going to look at that today. We need to understand that God is with us. And that when we're going through trials, this is what I knew in my spirit early this morning as I was, as I was really putting a finishing prayer time on this. <clears throat> is that there would be people here today that you're going through situations, you're going through circumstances. Some of you are going through trials and no one knows. But God knows. Amen. God knows. You can take it to God quicker than you can put it on Facebook. Right? Come on, preach it. And the wow. results will be much better. Yeah. Yeah. I need to tell you, you and I need to rely on the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It's not celebrating bad news, but what it does mean is that we can believe. That God is doing a redemptive work. The word redemptive here means that God does not waste a hurt or a disappointment. He's not going to waste the situation. He's going to use it. Somebody say amen. 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 Whatever you're going through today, you and I need to understand that he's using the situation to shape you. To build us. Into the image of Jesus Christ. This is his highest passion. Some people don't want to accept the fact that godly people go through trying times. But I'm going to tell you that I don't, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this carefully because good, godly, learned men and women have taught some truth when it comes to divine health and, and victorious Christian living and I respect and I receive that which is true. But it has also been abused because the Bible very plainly teaches us that it rains on the just and the unjust. That's right. And this idea that godly people are never sick, I, I, I believe we can be sick much less than we are. I believe that we should walk in health and we should walk in victory. But I'm telling you, it rings on the just and unjust. Sometimes we get colds. Sometimes we get fevers. Sometimes things happen and circumstances come. And 
People die and the divorce takes place and hurt takes place. And we have to deal with this within the church and within the body of Christ. We need to be aggressive in dealing with this and helping others dealing with this. That when we're going through suffering, we often pray and seek God more intensely than at other times. And so God uses these circumstances to push us to our knees. Amen. Amen. No matter how spiritual we get or feel, God will push us. His presence is there to gently push us, to remind us our greatest times of growth have been when we have reached the end of our resources. Amen. See? And when we have reached the end of our resources and all we have left is Jesus. Well, God uses suffering to make us rely on his presence. Psalms 23 in verse 4 of the 23rd Psalm, David writes that he does not fear because God is with him. Amen. He relies on God's presence and it, it brings him strength and it brings him comfort. Remember that for there to be a shadow, there has to be a light. Amen. Yes. Let's just, just talk a minute about darkness. What is darkness? There's not a scientific molecular makeup of darkness. Darkness is not something you find on the periodic table. Darkness is simply the absence of light. Uh, that's right. That's right. See? People say, I'm walking in darkness. Well, you're walking in the absence of light. And so we need to work on getting the light. Hallelujah. See? See, a shadow is nothing but the light shining, and there's an obstacle, and there creates a shadow. And that's where a lot of people, and that's where somebody here today might find yourself. You say, Pastor, I'm in a real dark place. I'm in the valley of the shadow. There it is. I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. I'm in a dark place mentally. I'm in a dark place spiritually. We're in a dark place relationally. My marriage is in a, a, a dark place. My my mind, my, my situation, my finances, my, my career uh, is in a dark place. Well, I've got good news. The sun is still shining. Yes. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. See, darkness... If you don't remember anything else I said today, this is the rainbow word that God gave me for this sermon. Yes. Darkness is a temporary reality. That's right. Yes. It's yes. a temporary reality. What people who commit suicide do not understand that it is temporary. It's not permanent Amen. as the voices have told you. It's not permanent as you have somehow convinced yourself or you've been distorted by the drug or by the alcohol or, or by the demons, the demonic spirits. There's two things you and I can do when we find ourselves in darkness. We can walk or we can wait. We can walk out of the darkness or we can wait on the sun to come up. Amen. Amen? Amen? We can walk out of the darkness or we can wait on the sun to come up. And darkness is a temporary reality. You might be here today and you're in the darkness. Now you can sit and wait in faith or you can begin the process of walking out of the darkness. The Bible says, wait upon the Lord, he shall renew your strength. Amen. Then he says, some really good things happen when you wait upon the Lord, he renews your strength. You shall mount up with wings as eagles. Right. Yeah. You shall walk. And not fight. You shall run. And not be weary. Woo! If you wait upon the Lord, the darkness will, the sun, see, even at night, even at night, 
Anybody have ever had the long night of the soul? Anybody know what a long night is? You may ever know what it is to have a headache or to have a pain or to have a sorrow or to have a burden and you can't sleep and you look up and it's not even midnight. And it finally gets to be one and it finally gets and you think, well, will this ever, this long night, you can be in the long night, but I'm going to tell you, even in the long night, in, in China, the sun is shining. The sun is always shining. You just wait. In a few hours, the sun will come up. In our circumstances, if we wait upon the Lord, the sun will come up. This is a temporary reality. This is a temporary situation. There are those times when we're in the darkness that it, it is time for us to walk out. It is time for us to make steps, to make changes, and rely on God's presence and let Him lead us from that dark place into the light to let him lead us into the warmth. And either way, whether you walk or wait, we have to rely on his presence. Yes. Yes. The psalmist said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. He's with us here. It's not hard to believe this preacher when you're in here. It's not hard to believe this. We, when we're in here singing and rejoicing, and we're in here and everybody, feel, I mean, anybody ever felt any, anybody felt any Holy Ghost do that this morning? <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've been feeling it. But when we get out in the field and we get out in the, in the, in the ditches of life and we get out in the circumstances and the church is not close, it seems that that we find ourselves in a place where we feel all alone. I, I know, I don't want to stir any negativity in anybody today, but I know what it is to have a panic attack. And uh, many of you here know what it is to have anxiety. Anxiety attack is different than panic attack. A panic attack is, <coughs> is horrible. It's horrible. And it causes you to want to run and walk. And I got to get out of it. And, 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 and uh, you know, sometimes I, I wanted to say, well, Ron, where are you going? <laughs> well, we need to learn to run to Jesus. Amen. And run to him and depend upon him. So wherever you're at in life this morning, whatever you're going through, rely on God's presence. <laughs> Listen to me. He's not going to leave you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you always, even until the end of the world. This is a promise to his disciples, and we claim it, and it is a promise to us. God's not going to leave you when you're broke. He's not going to leave you when you're broken. He's not going to leave you when you're sick. In another psalm, David reveals that one of the reasons for his joy is that he is Forgiven. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Psalms 31 and 1. We can't determine God's love for us based on good or bad circumstances. Do you hear that? Amen. You don't say, I, more than once in my life, I've, I've had people tell me that God was a liar. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you, in a moment like that, you, you, you pray and you're thankful for God's grace. Amen. The Bible very clearly states that God is not a man that he should lie. Right. I'm going to tell you, God can do anything, but the one thing he cannot do is lie. Amen. God's not a liar. He didn't right. fail you. He didn't drop the ball. He didn't forget you. He knows where you're at. We don't determine his love for us based on our circumstances based on who died, based on who's sick, based on who left us, based on how who mistreated us, based on who stole from us, based on who, who hit us, who hurt us. No, we base his love for us based on the cross. Not what he is going to do, but what he has already done. On the cross of Calvary, we, we rely on his presence and we know that he loves us because he gave his only son. He gave his only son yes, for us. 
When we're in a dark place, when we are hopeless, I'm going to stop here and ask anybody raise your hand and say, you genuinely think that at one point in your life you were hopeless? Raise your hand. We're talking about a serious place that people all around us can get to. We need to rely on the presence of God. Secondly, we need to rely on the provision that God has given us. He is with us, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul reveals that he has suffered from a thorn in the flesh. Some of y'all, some of y'all not going to like what I'm about to preach. But when I talk about provision, I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about gold. I'm not talking about the new Cadillac. I'm not talking, no, I'm talking about he will provide a thorn in your flesh. God was so concerned about Paul. He was so concerned that he would not become proud that he allowed this to happen to him. Nothing has happened in your life that God did not allow. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. I want to tell you, a thorn in the flesh is not fun. But it is provided by God to make us more like him. To make us more like our daddy. Amen. To make us walk like him and to talk like him. And while we're praying for God to remove the thorn, God is saying, I'm trying to use this thorn. And we're in a tug of war with God. In our current situations, God is saying to us that his grace is sufficient. Even when we feel weak, he's making us stronger. His grace is not a hypothetical <laughs> idea. It is the person of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. The trials, the challenges, the sickness that you're going through. Uh, it may be the very circumstance that God is using to take you to a whole new level. We, we come to January 1st and we pray, oh, we got a new resolution. We, we God take me to a new level. Are you sure you want God to take you to a new level? Right. Are you sure you want God to use you as never before? Are you sure that you want the gifts operating in your life? Are you sure that you want God to use you? Because I'm telling you, God doesn't prepare us the way we prepare ourselves. Right. We need to rely on the fact that he's provided a thorn in our flesh. I'll come back sometime and preach about thorns in the flesh. Everything that hurts is not a thorn in the flesh. Some of it is consequence of sin. For man shall reap what he sows. Whatsoever man sow, that shall he also. Everything's not a thorn in the flesh provided by God. Y'all so quiet, you're going to make me preach on this. <laughs> don't, don't act me on. <laughs> Somebody says, well... I don't like my husband. I don't like my wife. Well, God might be using them to make you a better husband or to make you a better wife. See, iron sharpens iron. Let's, let's make it, let's, let's talk about something that's more comfortable. Because I'm going to tell you, some, because I'm going to go back and say this. The, the devil can use some husbands. And the devil can use some life. I'm going to leave it alone. Let's go on. Let's just go on. Let's bring it to church, Brother Rick. Let's bring it to church and let's say it like this. Sometimes I just don't like my pastor. God might be using your pastor to help you grow. Some of the best people I've known in my life have been a thorn in my flesh. I'm not calling names. <laughs> Yet. Don't you know that in 35 years of, of pastoral work, don't you know that there's been a member or two that made me a better pastor? <laughs> Amen. Don't you know there's been a pastor or two that made you a better member? There's been an overseer or two that has made me a better leader. <laughs> God will provide a thorn in your flesh or what seems to be a hindrance when in fact it is to make you better. And we need to find hope in that. Yes. Yes. Amen. 
Some of y'all sitting at a job and you're praying, God, desperately get me out of this job. He's got you right where he wants you. He, he, and this is not for everyone, but if he, in fact, has you right where he wants you, he, he wants to teach you something through them, and he wants to teach them something through you. Right. Right. <coughs> Woo, it's quiet. That's good preaching, isn't it? Amen. You said, well, you don't know. My boss talks to me like I'm a dog. Well, the Bible says to turn the other cheek. The Bible says to pray for them that despitefully use you. See, not only will God use, God can use anything he wants. But he might use you to help him or to help her. So let's rely on what God has provided. Third thing this morning, if you're in a dark place and, and, and you're in a place of hopelessness or maybe you feel like you're inching toward that, You've got a decision. Do I need to walk? Do I need to wait? Pastor, what do I do? Well, you rely on his presence and you rely on what he has provided. And last this morning, you and I are going to rely on his power. Not our power. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We are not going to walk in the sin of self-sufficiency. I've heard people say this. I got this. I got this. Sometimes I won't say, you ain't got nothing. Yeah. Come on. No, I got this. My mama told me, I got my dad said, no, I got, I've learned. I, I thought I, I'll do this and I'll do that. I got this. No, you, you, you need to quit, quit handling things the way you always have. And you need to rely on God's presence, his provision, and his Holy Ghost power, not your power, Amen. not our power, but the Holy Ghost. We need to rely on the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Everybody in here needs to be seeking for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Everybody needs to walk in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Somebody says, well, I don't know about that speaking in tongues. Well, well I humbly say I do. And... And I, I'm not being a smart at it, but I'm telling you that if he has the power to make you speak in other tongues, then he has the power to help you do whatever else you need. Amen. If he's got your tongue, Amen. if he's got your tongue, come on. If he's got your tongue when you pray, then he'll have your tongue when you're at work. Amen. Right. Yes. Amen. See? Yes. He wants full control. He has the power, he has the provision. He, he, he wants to do a work. He said, my grace is sufficient. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. What is your weakness? Maybe it's a son or a daughter that hasn't quite turned out the way you thought they should. Let's just, let's just talk about this a minute. No, let's just talk about this. I, I don't want anybody raising their hands. And we're going to wait to play. But just look. My, my job is primarily, I didn't say completely, but primarily my job is to introduce my children to Jesus. Now, discipleship is still there. Guidance is still there. Pouring into their lives is still there. But I want everybody to understand, we need, all need to understand what is really simple, and that is there comes a day when they are accountable and they are going to be able to do whatever they want to do. The problem, the challenge, is that you're not the only one, Jonathan, that's pouring into their lives. Right. See, that's the problem. Yeah. Is that other, other people are also pouring into their lives. What we have to do, Rick, is we have to pour into their lives and prepare them for when somebody else pours into their lives. See, we have to have that foundational truth. So there's going to come a day when you're going to hear things that are going to be contrary to this. There's going to, you're going to go off to college one day and somebody's going to tell you that Jesus is this and not this. You're going to go to college. They're going to talk to you about Hindu. They're going to talk to you about Muslim. They're going to talk to you about this. And you say, well, Pastor, I just won't let them go to college. <laughs> 
I want to tell some parent here today, this is by the Spirit, I want to tell some parent here today, you cannot protect your child from everything that will harm them. Right. I remember that season in my life when I got to the point that I realized that I can't always stop the rock from hitting my son. I remember the day when he wobbled and wrecked his bike and broke his arm and came running to me. I remember standing there thinking I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to grab the bike. I was too far away. Maybe you're going through something today with your children and it had not turned out the way you planned. It rarely does. It rarely does. My heart has bled this week. My heart has, let me say it like this, my heart has been broken. But the family of a young man that last weekend became hopeless. Blaine stood in this building not too many months ago when Hunter and Amber Womack were married last year. I talked with him. And this young man somehow reached a point where he was hopeless. And he took his life. My goal and my vision for this church is that we are a place in the ministry that provides hope. The only real hope that we can provide is in Jesus Christ. To rely on his presence, to rely on what he's provided, to rely on his power. Maybe you're here and you hear voices telling you just to quit, give up. What does, that's what happens with suicide. What does it look like to give up? People, people tell me a lot of times, Pastor, I just feel like giving up. Well, what, do you, what do you mean give up? What does that mean? Does that mean you're not gonna get up in the morning? Does that mean you're going to... Oh, I, I see what you mean. That means you're going to take your life? You're going to just end your life? I want to tell somebody here today that just because you end the function of your brain does not mean that you end your eternity. The body, the soul, and the spirit, that, that when the body becomes... Uh, unable to facilitate the spirit at least. And when one commits suicide, the body dies, the spirit leaves. Now we're looking at eternity. Right. Amen. Amen. I've been asked that question a lot of times. I'm going to answer it the way Robbie Zacharias answered it. <laughs> it is not the way that I want to be God. It is not the way that I want to be done. Stand.